Good morning. My name is Hal Harden. I'm here with ha Attorney ha Harold Donnelly. We're from the Nashville Bar Association Historical Committee, and we're here today to take the video deposition of Attorney James Haver. Today's date is the 16th day of November. The videographer for this uh, presentation will be Chris Hulbert. He's with the Nashville firm of Val and Jennings. On behalf of the bar, we thank Mr. Hulbert and Mr. and Val and Jennings for donating this time and effort to produce this video. And also on behalf of the, the Nashville Bar, we thank you, Mr. Havern, for agreeing to this uh, interview. I guess the proper place to begin is uh, your childhood, Mr. Havern. Where, where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your family. All right. To begin with, my middle initial is C. Cowan, Zero Double Cowan, James Cowan. The reason I say that, when I was born, there weren't many James Havens. But I was born in Tullahoma, Tennessee, on August the 8th, 1908, in a house at the corner of Polk and Lauderdale. The house is still there. Two story frame house, as I recall. And uh, <laughs> my Father was T. A. Haverin. He was the editor and publisher of the Tullahoma Guardian, which was a weekly newspaper, also Cumberland Presbyterian Banner. I think that was monthly. My mother was Minnie Horton Cowan Haverin, and my I was named for my grandfather, Dr. James B. Cowan, who was a surgeon and was Chief Surgeon of General Forrest, by the way. In Tullahoma, I played with the other boys. The, I can tell you all about the creek there. There was the pan, the uh, Williams hole, and the chimney. The chimney was over your head. And uh, when I was about four or five years old, I attended school to the Mrs. Venable, that's B-E-N-A-B-L-E. Two ladies who taught public school in their home. Miss Grace taught the school, and Miss Alice taught voice. My sister took voice from her. But uh, I went to the public school there in Tullahoma. About the fourth grade, I think, I'm not certain of that. I had an older brother, Howard, Howard, T Howard Taylor Haveron, who was uh, in World War I. I was a typical kid brother. I thought that he won that war. And an older sister, Rosalie. There was another child in the family who died before I was born, but he was a very real presence to my mother and father. Um, we moved to Nashville when I was 11 years old and uh, lived at 1703-17th Avenue South. That's where my father bought a place there, and uh, I went to Tarbox and uh, finally graduated from, yeah, yeah, I graduated from Tarbox, I think, in 1924. I'm not certain of that. <clears throat> we were financially embarrassed, I think. I didn't realize it so much at the time, but we moved to another location. And I started work when I was 15 years old at the old Protestant hospital, running the elevator. I was paid $6 a week and only worked seven days a week. And then later I worked in the office and in the laboratory. And then I worked in various drug stores, became a soda jerker, uh, at Peabody Pharmacy, University Pharmacy, and several of them. And uh, you want me to keep on rambling like this? Yes, sir. All Go right. ahead. And uh, I uh, worked in Poly Inn. Well, it was a very popular short order restaurant on Hillsboro, right across the street from Hillsboro, from uh, Peabody College. And then I was working in one of the offices downtown when Mr. Rice, who had been one of the managers of Poly Inn, and who was, who was assistant manager at that time, later, 
of the Atlantic Ice Company, offered me a job down there, and I worked for the Atlantic Ice Company, first as a bill collector, and uh, then later as assistant cashier. One of the uh, other young men that ran work down there was Trig Moore, that's T-R-I-G-G-M-O-O-R-E, and uh, Trig went to Cumberland Law School, and I first heard of it, and I took over his job, and then uh, Alfred Carruthers and I went, we drove over to Lebanon mm -hmm. one time and talked with Dr. Stockton, who was president of Cumberland. I had not graduated from high school, never did graduate from high school. I attended Hume Fogg High School, and uh, I went to Cumberland University Law School. They let me in on basic, on the basis of my background and work that I had done. And the class graduated in 1930, and uh, I started practicing law the first Monday in May. 1931 in Old Hickory, I associated with Lewis Payne. I was with Lewis for several, oh, several years. I don't know exactly how long. Made some mighty good friends. One of them was Bird Douglas Kane, who was the editor and publisher of the Old Hickory News. He had offices in the same building that I did. And uh, I also had an office in, in Nashville, Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill Carr. Let me use an office. Everybody's been very nice to me. In the meantime, I'd met Jane Bright, and uh, Jane and I got off, went over, ran away, from, got married because I didn't have any money and didn't have an automobile. But then I became associated with Good Pastor and Carpenter, that's Henry Good Pastor and Bill Carpenter. And, uh, got interested to a certain extent in politics. In the meantime, Jane and I were married, and uh, we'd had one child, James Tyree Haveron, who died several months ago. And uh, I was able to get on the ticket for the, for the legislature, it served in the 1935 legislature, from the House of Representatives from Davidson County. And uh, as the years passed, and my practice built up a little bit, and uh, in the meantime, I uh, had served three years in the National Guard as an enlisted man, but I wanted to be an aviator. I served in the old 105th Observation Squadron in Tennessee, Tennessee National Guard. And then later on, I was able to obtain a reserve commission. I asked for a for commission in the infantry because I thought that was the Army, but they turned me down. And I finally ended up with the lieutenant's commission and the quartermaster, which I didn't want, but I got it. And uh, that was, of course, before World War II. When and then I resigned that when I was ordered to active duty for one year that and I'd been practicing all then about eight or nine years and had a wife and children and if if that uh, if I'd been away for a year well I was well, that was all gone and then uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and everything changed and in the meantime. Should I, can I go into a good moment, go into all that, how I obtained the commission and everything? Yes, sir. Please oh, tell us. All right. Or you can summarize it for us. Well, I can, this is one of those, those, those things it's hard to summarize, but, but I'll do it. In the meantime, I'd helped organize the Tennessee Automobile Dealers Association and also had something to do with the National Automobile Trade Association. And uh, I was executive secretary and general counsel and uh, the Ordnance Department in the Army had taken over the responsibility for uh, automobiles as well as guns and ammunition. And um, they had, they had uh, 
when uh, 7 December 1941, when Jeps bombed Pearl Harbor, they started forming units that uh, the Ordnance Department would uh, would help form, and I worked in those to do that, and uh, finally one day Jane, well, <laughs> I'm not going into that, anyway, um, we decided that I would see what I could do in the, in the Army, and I was able to uh, form a nucleus or a cadre for an ordnance company. And in uh, 11 November 1942, was commissioned a captain and com company commander of the 198th Ordnance Depot Company. We did our uh, basic training at uh, Raritan Arsenal, New Jersey. And uh, Jane and the children joined me there later on. And uh, we had a basic training at Raritan Arsenal. And uh, in January of 1943, my company and I were transferred to Fort Lewis, Washington, where we completed our uh, training. And uh, without checking my records, I can't be certain of the date, but it was the spring of 1943 that my company and I were transferred to Fort Richardson, Alaska. And I served there for several months. I remember Lieutenant Colonel Baber, that's B-A-B-E-R. Uh, he was a Deputy Ordnance Officer of the Alaskan Command and later, later Ordnance Officer, promoted full colonel, and said he wanted to see my area, so I took him out there and on and, and and going out, I told him something I, I, a, a, a soldier supposed never to do, but in this particular case, it worked out fine because I said, Colonel Baber, I'm not a trained ordnance officer. I couldn't star gauge a gun tube or operate an M9 director. But his reply was, go ahead, it doesn't make any difference. We can, fire, we, we can hire all those. And I didn't realize it, but he hated sham more than anything in the world. And after I'd been serving at uh, Fort Richardson for several months, I was transferred to Bethel, Alaska, a small station where I was made post ordnance officer. It was a small station, and I, I had in miniature what I'd have in a larger station. I didn't realize it at the time because I, my company was taken away from me, and I just had a few enlisted men. And then the Bethel was closed on uh, about what was put, put standby around uh, December of that year, and I came back and was sent to on uh, Arctic uh, maneuver as an observer. In uh, there's a maneuver of uh, I guess there's a battalion of men based a station at uh, Talkeetna, Alaska. That's about 40 miles north of Anchorage. And uh, there was some 25 or 30 men clustered in, a, in one group where we were supposed to be observers. And there's another ordnance officer there, and chemical warfare, and two Canadian officers, and all the, quite a few of them. We lived by ourselves. And we went across country, going on our way from uh, Talkeetna to Mount McKinley. And we said that it was experimental the, you know, the winter time. The idea was if we got there alive, what we did was, was correct. And if we didn't, what we did was incorrect. And it got really cold. And anyway, I was with them for about a month. And we started, those of us who were observers were ordered back from various, various places. And um, three of us came back. We were gone about 25 miles to Talkeetna. And when we pulled into Talkeetna that night, we looked at an outside elevator on the uh, trading post there and it showed 54 below zero, and that's cold. And I came on back to Fort Richardson and I was sent to Dutch Harbor, which is one of the best stations I ever had. Dutch Harbor, 
as a station in the Eastern Aleutians and essentially a, a naval base. And I was made post ordnance officer there. I had a composite company and about five lieutenants, and I did a good job, I think I did. I did work <clears> hard. <throat> I got a very uh, high compliment. I took my men for a forced march, five mile march every Saturday afternoon. And I was an old man. I was about 34 then, 35. I and I, I was just, it was one time I know we went up through Mountain Valley. I, I reconnoitered them in my Jeep before we took off. And it started raining and sleeting and snowing. And we'd gone so far we couldn't turn around. And I'd halt the, halt the company about every 15 or 20 minutes. And then I'd run to catch up with them. And when I caught, went to catch up with them, I heard one of the men in the ranks say, there goes the captain. If that little SOB can keep up, so can I. <laughs> so we, we made it, we came back. And I served at Bethel until around October, I think. And I don't mean Bethel, I mean uh, Dutch Harbor. And in the meantime, the commanding officer had written a very fine commendation to the department uh, ordinance officer about me. And he couldn't promote me because he didn't have a vacancy, but he asked for a vacancy or said if, I, if he couldn't promote me, why, maybe I should be sent somewhere where I could get promoted. Well, to make it long story short, he, he promoted me for the, to a major and I went to Shemya. That's S-H-E-M-Y-A. That's a small island in the western Aleutians, about 10 or 15 miles east of Attu. And that was supposed to be the B-29 base for the, uh, when we attacked the Japanese. Well, of course, the atomic bombs were dropped and that was uh, unnecessary. So uh, that was commanded by Brigadier General Goodman. Fine gentleman, rough, rough old fellow though. And How old were you when you went into the Army? I think I was 34. And you were born in what year? Uh, 1908. Okay. Yeah. And, and for the record, you mentioned General Forrest. Who was yeah. General Forrest? Well, I didn't know that I mentioned General Forrest. <laughs> in the Civil War? Yeah. Well, did you, did you know who he was? Uh, just for the record. Who would, he, was, he was a general of, of uh, primarily <clears throat> cavalry. He was a uh, lieutenant general in the Civil War, Confederate general. And he married my wife's first cousin. That's, that's a story on that. Okay. Uh, the story goes that he uh, talked with, with my great-grandfather, who was a common Presbyterian minister, and asked for, for permission to marry his ward, Mary Ann Montgomery, who was being reared with my grandfather. And uh, my great-grandfather supposed to have said to General Forrest, by General, you're a, you're, a, you're a mercenary man. You curse and you swear. And Mary Ann is a Christian girl. Forrest was supposed to have answered, yes, Parson, I know. That's why I want to marry her. And they <laughs> did get married. That was before the war. And it worked out very fine. Well, during your lifetime, you have seen a lot of changes to the bar. How many members of the bar were there when you first became a member? You mean in Nashville? Yes, sir. Gee, I don't know. No more than a few hundred, I would imagine. Oh, no, no, not any more than that, no. I, I, most of them were in the National Trust Building, the American Trust Building, and the Stallman Building. I'd say at least 80 or 90% of them were those three buildings. There were some other buildings where they were, but they were, they were, that's where most of them were. Did you have Christmas parties every uh, Christmas? The, not the bar, the various associations, bar associations would have a pub party, as I recall. And what type of uh, machines did you have in your law office when you first started? <laughs> Telephone. <laughs> we didn't know it in my office. Uh, And, and you uh, you mentioned earlier that you practiced with Judge Harry Luck, is that right? Yes. Who is he? Well, Judge Luck 
was one of the finest men I've ever known. I don't say that he was an outstanding lawyer, but he was financially stable and had lots of common sense. And he was a leading Republican. As a matter of fact, you all won't appreciate that today, but when my mother found out that I was associated with Judge Luck, her only comment was, he's a Republican. <laughs> he was the son of a Union soldier who came south during the Civil War. And uh, he had a daughter who had married a dentist out in uh, California, I believe, and they'd broken up and they'd been divorced. And he had a grandson with him. But uh, I, I, I can find Harry Luck as a very fine gentleman, an outstanding lawyer, his knowledge of the law. I'm not competent to pass judgment on that. But he had, he had sufficient finances that he didn't worry about that. But you, you also ran two campaigns. You ran a campaign for Trig Moore and for yes. Joe Burns, Jr. Who, who yes. were those gentlemen? Uh, well, I ran the campaign for a, a Trig Moore. He ran for a general session judge. He was one of the original general session judges. And then uh, when time came to run, run like he did, and he was a general session judge. He, he had worked at the Atlantic Ice Company. He was the man that introduced me actually to Cumberland. Uh, and Joe Burns Jr., you don't, don't know who Joe Burns was? I, I do, but maybe the audience doesn't. <laughs> well, Joe Burns Jr. was the son of the congressman. And I didn't manage really his campaign. I thought about that. That was a mistake. I managed his campaign in Davidson County. And he had a man named Walker that was supposed to manage his campaign altogether, but I, I did most of it anyway. And uh, we, were, we were won the first election, Joe ran, I think by better than a thousand votes. We had office in, we had our headquarters in the uh, Hermitage Hotel, and I remember the election night very well. And uh, Joe then, when he ran for a second election, he was defeated by uh, Percy Priest. Joe had a, was a, was a, was a smart as a whip. But anyway, I'm not going into that except he lost the election. Okay, when you attended Cumberland University, who was one of your most influential teachers? One of the smartest ones was Albert Williams, Judge Albert Williams. The dean of the law school was Judge uh, Chambers, Judge Billy Chambers. <laughs> and uh, our first textbook was History of a Lawsuit, which was written by uh, Carruthers, Carruthers History of a Lawsuit. And I remember that uh, Judge Chambers, Judge Chambers would, le would lecture and he, he would propound and give a question, and his secretary would pull up the name of a student by a card, and he would answer the question, or he couldn't answer, he just checked checkbook. So I remember one time, Joe, I've forgotten how the subject came about, but he said, what is the difference between a patriot and a rebel? And without asking, getting an opportunity, I jumped up and said, and said, Judge, if you win, you're a patriot. If you lose, you're a rebel. <laughs> he said, Yes, that's so. Turned to his secretary, What's that young man's name? I think that's the reason I passed his course. <laughs> but uh, he had a habit of um, making a proposition and telling how he followed the right, make the right decision, and he won the case. And that had been on, going on for some time. And finally, told everybody, he said, I draw, I, I, and I lost that case. Everybody was quiet and was quiet for a few seconds, then they all applauded. I think it hacked the old gentleman. But uh, Judge Albert Williams is one of the smartest men I've ever known. Who I, else attended uh, law school there with you that you that well, to practice uh, in Nashville? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, Felix Poulsen, uh Bud Yokely, mm. I belong to a fraternity, but I don't think there's any but it's nice for lineage. Was that the Sigma Delta Kappa? Yes, Sigma Delta Kappa, Sandika. 
Uh, well, when you were in the legislature, who, yeah. who was the governor at that time? Uh, McAllister. And were there other Nashville lawyers in the legislature? Oh my, yes. We, had, had a, had a, we ran on a ticket. And the two senators were George Kate and um, uh, oh, <laughs> Elmer Davies. And in the House, there's Leon Gilbert, Bill Martin, uh, W.C. Clark, uh, Harry. Phillips, well, he was a, he was a full floater, and there's one other one and myself. I'm trying to think of who that could be. Was it rather common for you lawyers to run for the legislature back in those days? I think it was to a very large extent. Yes, I know several of them asked me if, if I was going to run again, and I didn't do it. Uh, I became associated with a firm then. Good Pastor and Carpenter, Henry Good Pastor and Bill Carpenter. I associated with them for about a year, and uh, they didn't particularly want to get into it. But anyway, that's another reason. But, uh, but of course, I made four dollars a day. That was my pay as a legislator. Do you think it helped you and in, uh, in, in business? When you, you I out? it got my name before the public. I think it probably did. I don't, but I, I, I wasn't. Uh, I know before I took the bar, my father suggested that I go up and talk to uh, Dave Lansden, who was clerk of the Supreme Court. His father had been Chief Justice. And I went up there and introduced myself and started talking to him. He said, You related to Punk Haveron in the AEF at World War I? I said, Yes, sir, you know him? He said, Yeah, we've. Soldier together in France. And then after a while, he said, uh, "You, you're related to Professor James Haveron of uh, South Pittsburgh, Tennessee." I said, "Yes, sir. You know him?" He said, "Yes, I went to school to him." I thought, "Doggone, I'm making good progress." He says, "As a matter of fact, he fired me." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, w -w -w "What?" <laughs> he saw I had it coming to him. Dave, incidentally, turned out to be a mighty good friend to me. He gave me a lot of pointers. Well, you've you've seen a lot of lawyers in your lifetime. Tell us about some of the ones you think were the best. <clears throat> you mean the most capable? Well, the the, the yeah. most capable, uh, or, or any other category you want to put in. The well, intellectual, best trial uh, lawyers. Uh, I think Seth Norman. Seth Norman was an excellent trial lawyer. John Hooker was a Excellent trial lawyer, not to be confused with John Jay. Uh, I could take I could take Martindale and go down the list. But, uh, did Did you know Seth Walker very well? Uh, I knew him, yes, but I didn't know him well enough to call him by his first name. Of course, he's older than I. But that, that's I knew I knew John well enough. John Hooker Sr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Hooker. Not, no, not related to John J. I mean, not John J. Hooker is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and uh, I mean, I've, I've been retired for over 20 years. I'm after my wife died. I, just, I, was, I decided I would just uh, go to my office and leave at 12 o'clock. Well, I found out I'd get tied up on something else and I couldn't do it. Then I thought, well, I'd just go in there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I'd still get tied up. So I finally decided I'd retire, and I did. Uh, I was able to financially. And uh, not that I have a whole lot of money, but I had a pretty good income, which I thought it was. I haven't been able to pay all my debts. What about Jack Norman? Did you know him? I knew Jack quite well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was one case that I remember very well. Jack and I were on the same side, and we, it ended in a, in a mistrial for once. And uh, we uh, tried it again, and the other side uh, had, uh, they, they, they had a, a 
they were were represented by two very able lawyers. They fired those and got some more. And the second case took and decided a, a, a different turn. And Jack and I were working on that case, and he he took their, their star witness, and in my opinion, <coughs> completely destroyed it. And Jack said, "Well, Jim, suppose we submit this without without argument." I said, "Well, you've got more to lose than I have," which he did. So we submitted the case to the jury without arguing it, and the jury was, went out and re retired and stayed, stayed and stayed. Jack was walking around with that cigar stuck in his mouth. He came up and said, Jim, maybe we should have argued that, but it's too late now. <laughs> and pretty soon Nick came in and brought us, brought us a verdict, so everything worked out all right. <laughs> you recall uh, what the verdict was? Oh, yeah, it's our favor. It's, it's just, uh, it was a will contest case. And these will contest cases, the reason goes out the window in many cases. I, one of the first ones, I. Started out with, hadn't been practicing very long, and there were two, two sons in this case. I didn't know whether they were going to kill each other or kill me before the, the case was wound up. Where money's involved and, and, and the emotions are involved. Well, who was your favorite judge? You know, that's hard to say. <clears throat> I'll tell you the one that I liked. But I don't think that it was Judge Frank Langford. And I tell you this experience. <clears throat> I'd been practicing law long enough to know where the door of the courthouse was, just about all. And we had the, the uh, non jury docket. And uh, the lawyer on the other side didn't have too good a reputation. And Judge, Judge before Judge Langford, and he asked the other lawyer, said, What's the. What's the case? What is the case? And he says, suit on a contract. Turned to me, couldn't pronounce my name correctly. I said, what's your defense? I said, the defendant didn't sign the contract. Well, he turned, turned to the other lawyer and said, is that correct? Well, the other lawyer hemmed and he hauled and so forth. And finally, the judge looked at me and said, do you make a statement to this court of your own knowledge? By the way, they couldn't find the contract. Of your own knowledge that the defendant did not sign that contract. Well, I knew if I said yes, Your Honor, I won my lawsuit. I also knew that maybe it was a mistake. So I said, Your Honor, it's been two months since we tried this case in the lower court, and I don't think that she signed the contract, but I cannot categorically say that she didn't. About that time, they found the contract, and sure enough, she hadn't. And Langford never forgot, never forgot that, I don't think. <laughs> We've heard a lot about a judge named Judge Hildrop. Did you know him? Yes, I did. Tell us a little bit about him. Well, Judge Hildrop was a character in himself. I think Judge was, a, was a, just a title. Uh, I don't know he'd ever been on the bench. Uh, he was he was a character. Uh, he could, I just, I, I can't tell you about him very much. But was he a very funny man? He could be, yes. And very and, intellectual? No. <laughs> On the other hand, he could uh, he could speak intellectually to a jury. Well, tell us some of the uh, the major cases that you tried or were involved in. Looking back on your career, what do you what do you recall as some of the more important ones? Well, I don't want to go too much into that, but. but no, I, I, I don't want to go into those cases. Well, that's understandable. Yeah. yeah. But you were with, you, you were with tw like 20 years with Mr. Calicut and Mr. Marshall. Is yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And you all had a firm. What, tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, I was associated with uh, Good Passage and Carpenter, and uh, I sort of wanted to get out different. Both of them were fine gentlemen. They were different, they were different in daylight and dark. And Bill Boyne talked to me. I knew him pretty well. Bill was a fine man and lawyer. Said he'd like for me to come over and join with 
E and at that time it was um, E and Judge Luck, and uh, somebody was moving out. I forgot who it was, and I moved in with them. And I, I did. I moved in the National Trust Building, and uh, Judge Luck. I became very highly regarded judge. I thought a whole lot of judge Luck. I never will forget one question. This was uh, before World War II, and the so-called Ku Klux Klan had had a resurgence in Indiana. And it was, you, you could see it on the parades and everything and so forth. And I knew Judge Luck's background with his father being a Union soldier. And I also knew that the original Ku Klux Klan was quite different from this thing that we're having today. Incidentally, I knew uh, I, uh, I had a captain who was a member of this present-day Ku Klux Klan in the Aleutian Islands. And then, if he was in a, any, but anyway, to get back to Judge Luck, he was in my office one day, and I said, Judge, I knew his background. What is your opinion of the original Ku Klux Klan? He said, Jim, the same as the same as the South. And I wish I could have thought to ask him more questions than that. He died while I was overseas. But when I came back, um, he had died. Bill Bourne was still active. And uh, Claude Gallagher moved in with them, I'm thinking. Bill died. And Claude and uh, Richard Marshall and myself had the shared offices, and we decided that we would just form an organization, and we did. We had we were independent of each other, but uh, incidentally, we were different personalities, but we un understood each other very well, and uh, we were together. I think about 20 years before I retired. And where were your offices? National Trust Building. Okay. And. How many uh, family members went into the law? Well, my son was a lawyer. Uh, he died several months ago. He was public defender for several years. He was the first public defender of, of Davidson County, was he not? I don't think he was the first, but I'm not certain. Charlie Galbraith may have been the first. I think Charlie Galbraith was, yes. Uh, he was certainly one of the best. Yeah. How long was, was Jim public defender? Some 10 to 15 years. And he practiced law up until his death? Is yes, he, yes. He was not in very good health the last few years. How, how would you say the practice of law has changed in your lifetime? Well, advertisements. Lawyers are stirring up litigation, apparently. When I first heard about that, I couldn't believe it, and I went and got the Supreme Court opinion, I think it was sometime in 1970, in which they authorized the lawyers to advertise it, and that's what they've done. But uh, I guess I'm like all older members of any other trade or profession, although I, I don't think that's it entirely. Uh, but uh, I, I just I just don't, that I, we, we couldn't advertise when I was a lawyer. Not the direct advertisement, anyway. Of course, we tried to get out as much publicity as we could. We were, we, were, we were humoring them. You're talking about who was the best judge. When I came to the bar, we had two chancellors, Chancellor Part One and Chart Part Two. R.B.C. Howell was Chancellor Part, part One. James Newman was Chancellor of Part Two. Their personalities were different, but both were men of integ integrity, and both were men that uh, did what they thought was the right thing to do. But if you had a lawsuit with certain types and kinds, you'd try to get it to, to one of those chancellors who you thought might be able to more favorable to you. We're all human. I have never tried a case before a judge in a court of record that I thought was dishonest. 
I'm, I'm certain I have, but I didn't know it. Now that doesn't go back to the old days of where we had justice of the peace. But uh, the, the, three, the three circuit judges that, when I came to the bar, were Judge Rutherford, part one, Judge A.B. Neal, part two, and Judge Lankford, part three. And they were different personalities. But, uh, Do you think the lawyers were more civil to each other back then? Yes. Do you think that's changed over your lifetime? I don't know enough about that to say that. But, uh, Do, you, Do you have any advice for your young lawyers? I've thought about it. All I can say is work hard. I well, think I I don't know whether the law the bar is going to change or not. What do you mean by that? Whether they're going to go back to the old days or not. You think the old days were better? Well, I'm human. I guess so. If you had it to do all over again, would you still be a lawyer? Probably. I never thought about it to begin with as a young man. Mr. Havern, we thank you for your time. Well, I thank you for having the privilege. And I'm sorry I cannot be more articulate. You have been very articulate, and we're very honored. And I thought you were going to ask me how I won the one World War II, but you didn't. <laughs> how I chased the Japs out of Alaska. Well, can we, uh, can we save that for another day, <laughs> Chapter 2? I didn't do it. <laughs> well, I will have to tell you one thing. Do, I, please. When I went to Alaska, I had a depot company, and uh, I'd met, and I told you, Lieutenant Colonel Baber, and I was stationed at Fort Richardson, and he called me down there one day. He said, Haveron, I want a, one platoon from your company with a good sergeant. Uh, no officer to go on a classified mission. I said, yes, sir. Can you give me any idea where they're going? He said, they're going west. Well, that, there's only one island that was, had, still had Japs on it, was on Kiska. So I said, very good, sir. Got up, saluted, went out and got in my Jeep, started back to my area, and I thought, dog was gone. Well, one platoon in my company going into, into action, and I'm not going? So I turned around and went back. I said, Colonel Baby, I want to go. He said, well, you can't go. So uh, I didn't get to go. But when the Japanese landed on, on Kiska, they did, uh, I mean, when the American task force landed on Kiska, the Japanese had, had uh, evacuated the island. So uh, would it be logical to assume that they thought I was with the task force? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, I don't think I had anything to do with it. <laughs> Thank but you, Mr. Harris. It, it is true that they had, that they had uh, left the island. All right, sir. No, I, I was never in combat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.